Well, I didn't get to that in time. This is apple juniper rust, which is a crazy thing. You ought to see it when it gets wet after a rain. I plucked this one from the tree because it does harm the tree, and there's a lot on this tree. But crazy stuff. It looks like something from outer space. Hey guys, Chris Ignato here. So, you know, it's a beautiful weekend. I've been cooped up indoors for too long. I'm sure you've been too. And I've decided to go for a walk and see what kind of things there are to find. You know, maybe some insects, some mushrooms and fungi, and possibly even some reptiles or amphibians. I'm uh, going out today and maybe even tomorrow. So I hope you guys come along with me and we find some cool stuff. How do you like my awesome teeny bopper backpack in the background here? Yeah. So this is a deer rub. As you can see, that's pretty cool. This is a common fungus known as ceramic parchment. And you know, it pretty much gets its name because it looks like broken or checkered ceramic. It usually starts off white like this, and as it grows older, it gets darker. It has a pretty hard surface, but I really like how it looks. And I sometimes see it in some rather artistic formations. Always a fun thing. That's so soft. It's kind of neat where these uh, bracket fungus used to grow. And as they go away, they take the bark with them. Pretty cool. Again, this drives me nuts. Although this has been displaced for quite some time. So, you know, when I see things like this, I can't help thinking of places like Bastogne or Caratan and things like that in Europe in World War II. That's what it looks like when artillery hits a tree and it blows it apart and every piece of wood becomes shrapnel. Every splinter is, well, life-threatening. So, I better get back to more positive things, but wow, you know, what an interesting break. Are you herping? Oh. Oh, you, yeah. Yeah. You, is that what you're doing? Yep. Any, uh, how's your day going so far with that? Uh, just the northern water thing. Down by the, the rocks, or yeah. yeah, man, they love it in that spot. Which one? That's it. We're looking for brown snakes and ringnecks. Um, have you found them here? Nope, this is our first time. <laughs> so, check this out I'm walking along in the woods, seeing what there is to see, and finally enjoying some weather. I've been so stressed lately that when I get out, I'm, I'm just so worked up. But, anyways, I see two people, a guy and a girl looking under some rocks and things and I figure you know what I bet they're herping so I approach them and I'm like oh you're you're herping and they're like yeah and then the guy's like I know you you're Chris Ignato and uh let me just say we we talked for a while and it completely made my week in fact it made my month uh Sid this video goes out to you um, thank you so much for being, you know, a cool guy. Yeah, you know your stuff, you know, you're persistent with herping, and, you know, you know your species, and that's really cool. And it's also really cool that you recognized me and, you know, watch my channel and follow me on Instagram. Um, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much. You, uh, you completely made my month. So, anyways, I just had to say that. Really cool, and I'm very honored. Back to the video. So here's another bald-faced hornet, and this is its overwintering den. This is a female, and you know, I'm actually surprised that she's still in here. She chews out the rotted wood and makes pretty much a, a bedroom to overwinter in. This log I saw was kind of broken apart, so uh, upon further investigation, I found her. 
being late April and fairly warm lately, I'm surprised that she's still in here right now. But I guess they they don't really come out until a little bit later in the year to become to begin building their nest. Okay, so check this out. This over here is dogbane and the fibers make the strongest cordage in North America as far as I know. But it has an awesome soft downy seed dispersal that's just wonderful. It's so silky. And of course it's designed to be dispersed by the wind and spread the plants throughout the landscape. These are always fun to find. It's a type of cup fungus for obvious reasons, but my favorite ones are the elf cups and eyelash cup fungus. But it's a little too early for those. That looks a bit big for a squirrel. Possibly a raccoon or something. You've probably come across these underneath logs and rocks countless times. If you ever wondered what they were, they're actually slug eggs, and their color often ranges from white to a creamy yellow. This is white-tailed deer hair, and there's a dead giveaway that it's deer hair. Normally, you can't crease or bend animal hair at right angles. Deer and other ungulates actually have hollow hair, which allows you to form these creases of 90 degrees or more. See? That's what I'm talking about. So obviously people like to carve on beech trees because they have that smooth textured bark and the carvings, you know, stand out. But it's actually not good for the tree. You know, that's the tree's skin. So it opens up to infection and stuff like that. Plus has to, you know, spend its costly sap and antibiotics to heal that wound or at least protect it from invasive fungi and other things. So please, if you see a, a beech tree or you see somebody about to carve into it, you know, politely explain to them that that's not a good thing to do. Plus, you know, half the beech trees you see are just filled with things like this. And I gotta tell you, if you're carving your name and some girlfriend or vice versa on it, you know, and you don't stay together and you're going for a walk with somebody else someday, you know, it could be a little embarrassing. I mean, come on. Just leave the trees alone. Uh, and I'm sorry to be a downer. This is a sweat bee. And sweat bees are really cool. It's a group of bees. There's a bunch of different kinds indigenous to North America. And they're generally solitary. Although sometimes different females, if they haven't bred, will team up to help form a bit of a loose community. This is a... Uh... This is called habitat displacement. And what happens is you destroy a home that takes a couple years for the pHs and stuff to develop and everything to become just right for the creatures and stuff that live beneath logs. Doing this will cause those creatures to not have a home. And they'll try to migrate to other areas to live and run the risk of competition and conflict territorial disputes and everything. Doing this without replacing the log or stone kills wildlife. Drives me nuts. Of course, when you run into something like this, it's pretty obvious. You see the, the dark, fresh, exposed earth, and it's, as I said, it's just really obvious. So the best thing to do is just be kind and do an act of charity and try to replace the log as best you can, you know, the way you think it probably was before somebody came along and displaced it. So, sorry. So without even looking, I guarantee you there's gonna be northern two-line salamanders underneath some of these stones and probably some northern duskies if the water's oxygenated enough. Usually I find them under stones that are 
partially submerged, but I'm going to check a couple of these too. <laughs> there goes a the northern two line right there. Here's a northern two line salamander, which is in the brook salamander family. So there are a lot of salamanders that look pretty similar. Uh, and as I said, they're brook salamanders. This one's not as skittish as they usually are, which is kind of cool. And they're brook salamanders because they like to live in these places. Okay, so see how these stones have moss on top of them, grown on top of them and stuff? But some of them don't. In fact, this one has blackness, which is usually on the bottom, and the old insect homes. You see those? So clearly, this rock was actually the other way around. And somebody had flipped it upside down and then failed to put it back the way it was. And I can tell you already, that's the same deal. So let's have a look and see if I'm right or if we can actually replace it the way it should be. See what I mean? You can tell just by looking at it, that's the way it was supposed to be. See, when these things aren't put back right, all these creatures die. They're all dead now. That's how it should be, okay? Now he's a fun guy. So that's pretty cool. I just found some morals and not that kind. And I'm gonna harvest a couple for taking home. And these are really cool mushrooms. Pretty excited about this. They're actually called morels. I know I'm pronouncing it wrong. I do it every time. So one of the ways you can tell this is a moral is not just from this net-like appearance, but it'll be hollow all the way down, right through the stalk. See, it's hollow all the way. So that's how you know this is a, a true morel mushroom. Pretty exciting. And I'm definitely not telling you to harvest these on your own. Now, a funny thing about the false morels is once you eat them, they form monomethylhydrazine in your stomach, which is rocket fuel. And it's not really that funny. It's fatal. When you're out in the woods, try slowing down. People are in too much of a hurry. I'd say for every three steps, try slowing down to just one step. It makes a world of difference. You'll see a lot more stuff, and when you take your time, things treat you differently. The wildlife responds differently to you. Um, there are, that's one of the reasons why, you know, you see me holding wasps and all those kinds of things. You know, I take my time, and I quieten myself down on the inside. And it makes a big difference. Things pick up on that. It's really easy to do so. And you will be enriched for doing that. You know, smell the air. Try to hear everything. Not just the obvious stuff, but the tiniest, quietest sounds. You know, I have trouble tuning that out. I have an autism kind of thing, so, you know, it's different for me. But doing that enriches your wilderness experience. 